Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. What a, what a fantastic offering message. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Can you guys give it up for our incredible worship team as well? Wow, that was, uh, uh, I think, profound and anointed are the only words that uh, come to mind. How about you? Oh, man. Well, are you glad you're at church today? Are you glad that we have been gifted and blessed these brand new amazing chairs today? Oh, man. Well, then if you feel blessed and gifted, you better find somebody to sit in them with you because I got 300 of these, okay? Seriously, God doesn't give vessels that he doesn't intend for us to fill. Amen. So come on, let's be a people of evangelism. Let's be inviting people. Um, and also, let's be good stewards of what we have. Let's make sure that we're taking care of the chairs. And I know crumbs happen, but come on. Help a brother out who cleans the house on a Monday. I am both lead pastor and janitor. And it's awesome. And I love it. I love it. Church planning is the best thing to ever happen to me after meeting Jesus and after my wife. So it's good stuff. But who's ready for the Word of God this morning? Come on. Oh my gosh. I just can't get past it. I thought worship was magnificent. This morning has been so good and I am so ready. Um, and I also just, hey, um, we're a family. We're a family. Um, and I think about when families get together, I don't, you know, however long you've been a part of it or how short you've been a part of it, when families get together and we notice that somebody isn't there who should be there, how many of you know you start asking questions? You start asking, hey, have you seen so-and-so? Hey, why is so-and-so here? Why is cousin, uncle, Bob, whoever isn't here? What's going on? And then you probably ask them. Church is the same way. If there's somebody that you feel like, man, they're just in a season and they ain't been in in a while, hit them up. Take that personal responsibility upon yourself to love your brothers and sisters in Christ and in the takeover family well. Amen? So I just want to lay that out there because you know what? Adrian and I, our amazing team, we can't do it all and we can't do it all the time. We need one another. Sound good? So check up on one another. It's good. And relationships make the world go round. Amen? All right. Who's got their notes? On or around your seat, there is a, uh, right in front of you, if you're new with us, there's a welcome home card. You can fill that bad Jackson out and turn that into welcome center after service uh, so we can get in touch with you, see how you like church, if you want to be involved in any way, we would love to get to know you. Two, there is also a prayer journal that has the ability to write in it. So if you would like notes that is not on your phone, feel free to, you know, help yourself to one of those. There should be a pen on or around your seat as well. But hey, we are in a message series called what? Oh, come on. I know the Jesus people are louder than that. We're in a series called what? The Jesus people. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, as we've been doing for the last four weeks, we have a Jesus people prayer that I'm going to read, and then you're going to say it right after me. We all know how this works by now, right? All right, so it'll be up on the Sky Bible. I'll read it. You repeat after me, and we're going to be on the same page, one heart, one soul, one spirit today. Sound good? All right, here we go. Father God. Father God. Father God. Father God. Build your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her. Give us your heart. Give us your words. Give us your power. Create in us a zeal for your house and a longing and a longing and a longing for your presence. Oh, that coffee hit hard. Oh my gosh, I just aspirated. Fill, 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 fill. 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 Purify. purify, and mark us, make us like Jesus. Set us apart, make us a holy nation. Make your presence known here, known here, known here. Establish signs and wonders among your people. Pour out, pour out, pour out your spirit upon us. Upon who? Upon us. We live. We will be. We will be. We will be your people. You will be. You will be. You will be. 
our God, we declare your kingdom come, your will be done in our city as it is in heaven. Let revival come. And a faith-filled church said boldly, amen. Come on, King Jesus. King Jesus. Man, I could just feel heaven all up in this place. Well, if you're taking notes, the title of my message this morning is this, Living in the Glory. Living in the Glory. Living in the Glory. And if you're old school Pentecostal like me, you know, you had some praying mothers in the church that were like, Shekinah Glory. That's where we're going today. Preface, Shekinah Glory. <laughs> Kidding. Living in the glory. And if you got your Bibles, bust those bad Jacksons out. We're going to John 17. And John 17 is so good that we are going to hit all 26 verses. You're like, wait, what? Yeah. We are in Bible school today. Living in the glory. John 17, 1 through 26. But if you don't have a Bible, uh, there will be Sky Bible right back there. My boy Adrian is in the booth holding it down. Give it up for him. Come on. All right. What a legend. Just lives to serve. I love him so much microphone work in the name of Jesus. All right, you ready? Yeah. Verse one, here we go. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come to glorify your son, that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh, not just some flesh, all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having you accomplish the work that you have gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You trying to switch me out? Give it up for Pastor Evan, man of many talents, man of many talents. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, somebody say now. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the word that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have all believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, God. Verse 10, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me. That they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I have kept them in your name, which you, ha you have given to me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, Judas. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. These things I speak in the world that they may have by joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth because your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for the sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but all those, for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory, the glory, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, and that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. Love them as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me 
before the foundation of the earth. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you, that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. We're going to pray, and we're going to unload today. Sound good? Who's ready to let the clip off with that verse? It's going to be good. Let's pray, and let's see what the Lord will do. Father God, we thank you so much. King of kings, Lord of lords, we thank you for everything that you're doing in the service already, God, right now, Father. We just ask, Lord, that you would begin a work in us of sanctification, a work in us of discipleship, a work in us, God, where we begin to look less like us and more like you, King Jesus. That today, God, I pray that eyes that need to see would be open in this room. The ears that need to hear would be open in this room, God. Right now, Father, that the heads of the weary would be lifted and we would find ourselves in a place to receive, God. So right now, begin a holy work, a supernatural work, something on the inside of us that lets us know you are loving and you are changing and you are taking things away and you are adding into us and you are purposing and intentional with your children, God. So, Father, I just thank you for this morning, everything you're about to do. Holy Spirit, we say, come, have your way in us and in this place and every other spirit. You go back to hell where you came from because this is holy ground. This is holy land. We are a set-apart people for a set-apart king, and we worship you alone, King Jesus. And a faith-filled church said, Amen. Amen. Living in the glory. Living in the glory the glory. So the last few weeks we've been on a journey here at church of of being the Jesus people. And for me, this has been really exciting because, man, I I feel like if I look at the church at large, if I look at the church in Grand Rapids, and if I look at just kind of where things are right now, it's very clear and evident to me, and probably to you as well, that we are missing key elements that are the foundations for our faith. That the church is in desperate need because, listen, we never graduate beyond the basics. We never graduate. The basics are not JV. They are AP, okay? This is varsity. The basics of our faith, we never outgrow them because the foundation of our faith is the launching pad to everything else. Amen? We need Christ alone, the cornerstone. We need him to be the bedrock. We need him to be our foundation and everything that we've built upon the last four weeks has been pointing to this place to this Sunday where I'm hoping the fun begins. I feel like it's been fun. Don't get me wrong. But now that we've laid the foundation, now that the concrete has been poured, now that we have made it, we've understood, you know what? I don't just dedicate my life. I must be born again. We remember that? And then we talked about how we need to begin and build our lives on Christ alone, the solid rock, the foundation, because what happens, wind comes, rain blows, and the house goes down if it's not built any other way. Amen. And then from there, Pastor Scott brought a great word. Come on. That was amazing on evangelism, part of our faith, giving the good news. And then last week, we talked about the sanctification, the inner working, the the inner discipleship, not just what it looks like to be the church outside these walls, but what it looks like to be the church on the inside of us. And how Jesus' whole goal for us is to be made more like him, that he purchased us. And then from there, a good work had to begin. And so today, I I truly believe the fun is going to begin because we have laid the found, we have explored the foundational of our faith. And today, we take a turn in this series where we begin to to explore the exceptional in our faith. Amen. Does anybody want to explore the exceptional in our faith? I'm talking the stellar. I'm talking the outer worldly. I'm talking the stuff in our faith that truly begins to set us apart. Now we have a foundation of how we live differently. Now we will begin to show you how we act act differently, how we pursue differently, how we live differently. Amen. We are a holy people, a consecrated people. We're called a peculiar people. If you don't know what the word peculiar means, weird. We are weird and that's okay. And it's my hope and my prayer that as we begin to take this pivot in the Jesus people that we would understand what it looks like to truly be the Jesus people. And for me, for me being the Jesus people, man, it became very clear to me this week that 
as the Jesus people, we are not completely understanding of the new creation, the new being, the new reality, the new lens of which we are to view and act and live and think about the world around us. It became clear to me. I was like, man, there's got to be some sort of language, God, that I can give our people that would set us up and motivate us and realize, man, we are different. We're different. And it's okay because in the different from us, in the otherworldly for us, in the outside and the exceptional for us is this area, this land, this place, this reality of which you and I now live in called glory. We live in glory. You see, friends, as Jesus' people, we live in glory and we are not worldly. We live in glory and we are not worldly. We might be in the world, but we live from glory. We might be in the world, but we now live from this place, this position, this new reality called glory. And it is my hope and my prayer today that you would realize come Monday morning, when you wake up, your first waking thought before your feet hit the cold floor beneath you is I do not live in this world to be a part of this world, but I live in this world to bring glory to this world. We are a glory people, not a worldly people. We are a glory people, not a worldly people. You see, friends, so often in this life, the reason, the reason, I think it's twofold. I think one, we're not educated about it. I think we haven't talked about it long enough. We haven't talked about this new worldview, this new plane of existence that you and I now live from. Friends, we have this unique way now because we've been saved, redeemed, bought with the price. Jesus has placed us in heavenly places. We are both here and there simultaneously at the same time. Don't expect me to tell you how it all works. He put it in his word and I believe it. It is how we live now. And because we are seated right now, in heavenly places, you and I now live from this unique place that sets us apart from every other human being on the planet. The worldly and the glory. The worldly and the glory. Glory. You know, it's funny to me as I think about that and I wonder, I wonder why we don't, aren't a people who live from the glory. I think it's because one, we haven't educated it and two, we haven't modeled it. We haven't talked about it. We haven't brought this out into practicalities. And I understand that, listen, friends, not every part of our faith is something that is practical, that is two plus two equals four. Not every part of Jesus is two plus two equals four. Most things with Jesus are not two plus two equals four. Most things with Jesus are he does the majority of the saving and we just try not to screw it up. Right. Amen? Right? Like, it doesn't make sense, but this is grace. Like, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so, friends, when it comes to living from glory, it's my hope today to give some sort of, quote-unquote, practical guidance to how we, in, how we can best minister to our world and live out our godly callings in this life from a place and position of glory. Amen? Because here's the deal. I think so often we don't live from glory because, man, in glory, in this place that we've now been adopted into, we are a separate being. We are a separate place. And inside glory is where the Christian is most comfortable, is where the Christian thrives the most, is where the Christian has the dreams of God, has the words of knowledge, has the abilities of gifts and tongues and all these things that come along with it. Suddenly we're long-suffering because we live in glory. Suddenly we're kind because we live in glory. Suddenly we're patient because we live in glory. Suddenly we are evangelizing because we live in glory. Suddenly we are praying over people at Walmart because we live in glory. And I think the reason that that isn't the majority of our lives and our experience is because we have something called affection that leads to distraction from the glory of God. You see, so often we're living this life of I'm in the glory of God. This is now my place of being. I am now a Christian. This is my new reality. I view the world from the glory of God. I interpret people via the, uh, the, the glory of God. I respond to my spouse by the glory of God. You know what I'm saying? Like we start living differently, amen? But the problem comes when we allow separate affections for Jesus. You see, the glory of God is where every other lover 
every other affection, every other idol or item or person or place or thing or, or a, a accomplishment comes to be laid to rest because in Jesus, there is no other lover. In Jesus, there is no other affection. In Jesus, there is no other, no other. There is no other. And when we begin to have affections outside of Jesus that can't, can't come in to glory with us, that's when we begin to live distracted. All of a sudden, these affections for the world, the affections for how they think, the affections for how they do things, and honestly, it can start well-meaning. It can start, you can start with just going, I want to be kinder to people, and then all of a sudden, being kinder to people takes you to be affirming of this, that, and the other thing, and suddenly, your affections went from Jesus being dist- and then to distractions from the world, and suddenly, you find yourself as a person, double-minded, living split in half, attempting to be a citizen of glory while looking worldly. We interpret the world through God's glory. We do not interpret God's glory through the worldly. Hear me. We do not interpret God's glory through lens of the worldly. We interpret the worldly through the lens of God's glory. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Friends, can you think about this? This glory place is reserved for holy land. This glory place, it is reserved for God's people. This glory that we live in literally is a veil that now separates us. It is the living and the dead, the saved and the unsaved. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? We are set apart and then those are still far off. This is the breakdown right here. And we start thinking that we're called to be in the world and then suddenly we start to become part of the world. But friends, before we are ever quote-unquote in the world, it's almost as if we have this armor of God on that he calls us to lace up in every single day that is binding, that is overhauling, that is this force field around us that even though we live in the world, we are still separate from the world. We are a different breed. We are a new creation. That's literally what it means. We are first of our kind. We are separate. There are humans, fallen, broken, sinful, broken creatures, and then there are Jesus's saved sons and daughters. We are separate. We are separate. And it's out of that separateness that we need to begin to interpret the world and the things of it around us differently through glory. We are living in the glory. I mean, think about it. Think about practically how you would approach your life. If you woke up every day going, today I'm going to live from and for the glory of God. Suddenly it's like, whoa, Tinder. Yo, I don't swipe right in the glory of God. Know what I'm saying? Whoa, late night DMs. I'm not responding to those in the glory of God. Think about it. When you begin to practically say, I'm going to live from the glory of God today, suddenly what you allow in your life looks a lot different, right? All of a sudden, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a holy priesthood. I'm a royal nation. I'm a son and daughter of the Most High God. Is this something that can exist in the glory of God? Not that you can choose to do, but is this something that has the right to exist with you in your new holy reservation? in your new holy reservation, suddenly it's like, wow, I've been hurt a lot in my life. Wow, my dad was abusive. Wow, my mom was, was absent. Wow, I've gone through some things. I've seen some things. I've experienced some things. But are those things allowed to live in me and be my drive and motivating factor in the glory of God? Or does the glory of God cause me to want to forgive? Does the glory of God say, I got to drop my baggage at the door when I come in these gates? Does the glory of God say, I've got to change in here Because unforgiveness and bitterness cannot exist in the glory of God. God is not bitter, is he? No, he's perfect. He's holy. He's whole. He's set apart. And so are we called to be. And so there are things in our lives that we begin to now leave out. I mean, think about it, friends. Some of us in here, you got great jobs. And you got a lot of money. 
And some of us, money is our prime motivating factor. But in the glory of God, money can't be our prime motivating factor. Get rich or die trying didn't work for 50 cent and it won't work for you. Like in the glory of God, okay? In the glory of God, that's not our prime motivating factor. In fact, we come like the rich, wrong, rich young ruler and we go, am I going to follow Jesus and just use money to glorify him? Or am I going to keep money to glorify me and make a posh life? What am I going to do? Like these are the practical things here today where we begin to explore, does this belong in the glory of God? Because friends, all of a sudden you put that lens on, you start seeing the world that way and you're like, I know that person out there is doing weird, nasty things, but God's heart breaks for them. Is my heart broken in glory for them? Am I living just angry at the world? Like Jesus isn't surprised, okay? Let me, let me say my favorite quote that my wife hates. Heathen's going to heath, okay? I'm not surprised when the world acts like the world. I'm not surprised when depravity has depravity. I'm not surprised when this happens. If we are living in and from glory, then if God's heart is broken for his children that aren't his yet, our heart should be broken for his children who are not his yet. I know it's hard not to get angry and be like, look at where the world is going. But friends, we live in the glory of God. The world is our mission field. It is not our habitation. Hear me today. We inhabit the glory of God first and foremost. And then by extension of the glory of God, we go into all the world. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? I think the church needs to be reminded in this hour, we are separate and that's okay. We are separate, which means the affairs of man are not the concerns or the affairs of God. We need to get busy about our Father's business of saving, of redeeming, of rescuing. And we need to go to the least of these and love them. I don't know if anybody saw the leader of the satanic cult in South Africa got saved this last week. Amazing. You should check out that YouTube video. He gives his own personal testimony and it is glorious. Is he perfect? No. Does he have perfect theology? He's been saved a week. No. But guess what? He now is poised to begin to live from the glory and man we're believing for a revival in the satanic temple in south africa just like we're believing for revival in grand rapids come on somebody man so many of us we got these big dreams revival jesus take over right it's the name of our church but friends if jesus doesn't first take over us he can't take over through us we have to begin to live as a people who live and operate from the glory of God. You see, the glory of God, this, this new reality that we get called to live in, it changes. It changes everything. It's no longer this longing standards. This isn't performance-based. This is positional. This is, where are you seated? Where are you put? Where has God rescued you from? You see, friends, Jesus, in the beginning of this verse, he's about to go to his death. This is called the high priestly prayer that we get a, a voyeur view into where we get to hear the outside view. John is with him in the garden and he is praying to God. It's called the high priestly prayer. And the next morning, Judas Iscariot will trade the life of Jesus for a little bit of silver that equals out to about $600 today, probably 400 given inflation. Less than, by the way. But it's nothing. It's nothing. But he trades Jesus' life for it. And we see this moment. Jesus is praying this prayer. And he says, Father, the time has come to have the Son of God glorified, be manifested with you, to be offered up and exchanged for this. All authority and dominion has been given to me and manifested in that is eternal life. And not only eternal life for Jesus, eternal life for all those who would now follow Jesus. Amen. What's amazing is in this verse, it's very clear. Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. Jesus' life was offered up. Jesus 
His life wasn't stolen. He gave his life. Friends, and this makes a world of difference. That's why you got to get your theology correct. Because if we're living in a world where we think that Jesus' was life was stolen from him, man, that's going to cheapen grace. Man, that cheapens our salvation. No, no, no. He was a willing lamb, perfect lamb, blameless lamb. And he said, I exchange it all. I'll take the glory so you can get the glory. Amen? And suddenly you and I now begin to exist from this new reality, this new found place. And he says, eternal life, but not just for me, all those who have followed me. I love this because Jesus, he goes on in this portion of scripture to say to, to God, he is praying to God. How many of you know when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit begin to have a conversation and we're graced enough to have a text of it, that's probably something we should pay attention to. How many of you know that this whole thing, when he says, it's time for me to be offered up, this is the moment where, man, the blood-soaked signature of Jesus is on the cross, is the signing on the contract for yours and my salvation. Amen? This is the moment where history changed. From the end to the beginning to the beginning to the end, the veil was torn from the top down, and suddenly Everything in existence that's ever been had now a real chance to live for the first time. This is amazing, and this is a moment that we need to take so serious because Jesus, he's saying this thing about eternal life for all those who follow him, all those who will come to know him, the people that he has given his name to, who have believed the word of God. He speaks about this right in those first five verses. And friends, you and I, we live from a place for whatever reason, we often are found attempting to renegotiate the deal of God and Jesus' contract. <laughs> Don't we? We live from this place of like, we're trying to negotiate, and I'm saying, friends, creation doesn't negotiate with its creator. Creation doesn't negotiate with creator. You see, Jesus' way and Jesus' word and Jesus' winnings are all available to us, but they only come by Jesus' way, Jesus' words, and Jesus' winnings. We don't negotiate this deal. But we live like we want to. We're like, how do I get uh, all of the winnings of Jesus but get to keep all of my sinnings? Like, is there a deal? Is that possible? Like, Jesus, can we just... Could we rewrite the contract real quick? Could I have everything you won and keep everything that's causing me to lose? Like, is this possible? And Jesus is like, hey, bro, I get it. Pawn Stars is a big show for you guys down there. But I don't work at Pawn Stars. I don't just go, hey, uh, the best I could do is partial freedom in a sight of sin. No. There is no better deal. You will find no better deal. You will find no better deal. There is no way you keeping your sin actually is better for you. There's no way. And Jesus says, man, I have signed, sealed, delivered. My broken body is the blood-soaked signature on the contract that changes everything. And then Jesus says this statement. He says, I am praying for them. All of those who have met me, who have my name, who follow me, all those who are now Christians, who are brothers and sisters in Christ, I am praying for them. Friends, pause right there because this is the craziest statement in the world. So many of us, we come to church and the second something's going on in our lives, we go, Pastor Matt, Pastor Adrian, Pastor Scott, Pastor whoever, I need you to pray for me. And it's like, well, why? Because... You want somebody who is, in your knowledge, spiritually author authoritative, somebody who has the knowledge, and someone you hope is close to God, right? You go to your pastors because you're going, oh, you've got spiritual authority. Oh, you can break chains. Oh, you have all this. You have it all together. You are close to God's heart because you're, quote unquote, more saved than me. And that's how we treat prayer in the church, right? But I got good news for you. Jesus Christ himself right now, if you are a Christian in this place, he is praying for you. 
You have got the person who's the closest to God, who has all authority in heaven and earth given over to him, who breaks the yokes, who lifts the head, who breaks chains, who can set you free and set you right on his path for your life. That's Jesus. You see, friends, the good news of this scripture of living in glory is that when you're living in glory, the son of glory is praying for you. You see, in the world, if you're saved, Jesus prays for you. If you're unsaved, Jesus is pursuing you. We're separate. We're separate. We're separate. Once you are a son and once you are a daughter, Jesus begins to pray for you, not simply pursue you. If you're still unsaved and unsure of Jesus, he is still pursuing you. But us in our arrogance, we always go, oh, I found God. Oh, they found God. Their lives are changed. Friends, we didn't find God. We didn't find God. We found ourselves chasing our tail in every which direction but God. And suddenly when we found the fact that every drug and every sex and every single person we've met is empty, suddenly we turn around and we realize God's been hot in our tail this whole time. God found you. You didn't find God. He's been chasing you. We didn't initiate this. He says, I'm not praying for those in the world. I'm pursuing those in the world, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for my body. I'm praying for my bride. Do I got any men in here that are going to start praying for their bride like Jesus? That wasn't a good response. Come on. Single fellas, like, I'm praying for my bride every day. Like, <laughs> calm down. But that's the great dichotomy. That's the great paradox. Jesus started this relationship with you. You didn't start this with him. You didn't start this with him. He's been pursuing creation this entire time. He made a way where there was no way to come and be the way for a relationship with you. He started this and he finishes it. Our only duty is to respond. But how many of you know Jesus is praying for you. That should be the most assurance you've ever felt in your life. When you are living in the glory, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, blood-soaked robe, come back with a sword. That guy, praying for you. Praying for you. How many of you know the gates of hell can't prevail when the King of Kings is praying for you? Come on. How many of you know your history doesn't get to catch up with you when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is praying for you? Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Those generational curses of divorce and, and adultery and drug use and all of these things, they don't get to write your future. They remain in your history. Why? Because the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is praying for you. And can I tell you this too, friends? This is why we, as the prayed for, need to begin to marry our prayers and mirror our prayers after Jesus's. Pause, Matt. What you mean right there? I'll tell you what I mean. It means that we never pray, God, if it's your will. We don't pray that. Why? Because we have an entire Bible full of what it says is God's will. I don't need to know if it's God's will or plead my case before him and say, God, if it's your will, if you could find it in your dignity, in your, in your wonderful, in your majesty. Like, he's not a king of England. He's the king of the universe. And he goes, his words are, well, go and sin no more. Your faith has made you well. His words are, well, I was pierced for your transgressions. I was bruised by your decree, and it's by my stripes on my back that you're healed. So what do we pray in response to that? We say, well, God, heal them in Jesus' name. By your stripes, they're healed. Go and sin no more. Come on, your faith has made you well. Suddenly, we start to pair it. We start to pair. We start to marry. We start to mirror the prayers of Jesus Christ himself because if he's the one praying them, how many of you know we should be praying them? And that's where the power is. The power is in the mirroring. The power is in the marrying. The power is in the parroting. The power is in our pairing. Man, some of us are going through financial difficulty and we just need to start praying, God, you said I was made in your image. And yet you told us in your word that even the sparrows have food. Even the sparrows are taken care of. Even the sparrows are provided for. How much more do you love us, God? I kind of need to see that right now. I know I've been unwise with my money. I know I haven't been tithing. I know I've been completely belligerent and unfaithful with it. But God, if you could help me out. And Jesus is in heaven 
praying the prayers for you that's saying, Father, we told them, we loved them, we made them in our image. They're our Imago day. When we made them, we said, it's not just good, it's very good. Father, we said we care for them more than the sparrows. We need to unleash the full wealth of heaven in their lives because that's what we said we're going to do. This is what he does. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. I'm pursuing them. But in the glory is Jesus' prayer. See, I'm trying to marry the practical and the spiritual, but friends, there are just some things that we got to let go of the practical and we just got to start going into the supernatural. We got to just start saying, wow, it doesn't make sense. I can't understand that. There is no Rubik's Cube or cheat code to God. There is simply his way, his truth, and his life, and I need to live and abound and abide in that and in that place of glory. Jesus himself, more than Pastor Matt, more than Pastor Adrian, who's got the craziest prayers of all time, Adrian goes, at the, Adrian goes to the gates of hell with a voice and a squirt gun and lets them know it's on. Like, God bless her. Amen? She don't need a super soaker. She's like, Psh, I'm going to shout. But more than that, more than a pastor or a prophet, how many of you know Jesus is praying for you? And then I love this part. I love this part. Come on, come on, come with me. Come with me there. Jesus then goes, God, they have kept your word. They've received your word. God, it's not my prayer that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil ones, and then you sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. Let's break that down, shall we? I love this part. I love this part. He's like, Father, don't take them out of the world. And we're sitting here going, why? That would be cool. Right? We're like, uh, not a Christian in the house isn't going, I would totally dig heaven right now. We would. We would totally dig heaven right now. That would be amazing. But he's saying, keep them from the evil one. In my name, I've sealed them. In my name, I have kept them and guarded them. They are in the world. Don't take them out of it but keep them from the evil one. Friends, that word kept right there, that word kept is the biggest word in this prayer. Because that keptness speaks to safety. That keptness speaks to the assurance. If Jesus is saying, Father, in your name, I have kept them, that should be the most assuring thing you have heard this week. Should probably be the most assuring thing you've ever heard in your life. In your name, I have sealed them and kept them. Friends, we live our entire lives with a deep longing for security and safety. Every single one of us do. You want to know how I know that? Because we will try everything under the sun at least five times to try and find that peace, that assurance, that safety, that security, that oneness, that keptness, where we are safe beyond measure where the wolves are kept at bay, where lies don't exist, where we are certain of whose we are and what we are, amen? Like we all search every hill, every valley, every bottle, every woman, every man. We will go through every app, every drug, everything. We will go through it all in our brokenness to find what is only found in oneness with Christ. He's like, I've kept them. I've kept them. I have hidden them, tucked them away. And then he says, and you've guarded them with your name. You see, Jesus keeps you and God guards you. Hear me. That's very profound. Jesus keeps you and God guards you. Matt, what does that mean? It means in glory. In glory, where we now live, this relationship we've now been adopted into, this whole situation that we now exist in, we are surrounded in glory by gates of glory that are sealed shut, locked tight by the name of God, Yahweh. Yahweh seals this place. 
Yahweh seals our fate. Yahweh guards us. Yahweh keeps us. Yahweh keeps everything else out. Friends, hear me today. The gates of Yahweh for the Christian says, come this way. And if for every demon or devil in the hell says, no way. Amen. You're not welcome here. You're not welcome here. You see, this is holy ground. And God's gate of glory is sealed with his name and all authority. Now, friends, there's a reason Jesus says this next phrase. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. By your truth, which is your word. Pause. Sanctify them. Some of y'all didn't take me serious last week when I was talking about sanctification. But how many of you know when Jesus is praying to God and says sanctify them, it ain't a suggestion or a negotiation. This is a commandment. Like you and I, we need to be sanctified if we're going to live in the glory of God. Amen? You see, here is the deal about sanctification. God will sanctify you as his children. It'll either be an empowering sanctification or a humbling sanctification. Which way you want it? Matt McClure knows this way too well. <laughs> how we are sanctified is all dependent upon how we give our lives over to the glory of God. Are we going to have to learn the hard way or the empowered way? Are we going to need to be humbled or are we just going to bask in the glory set before us and offering up our entire lives and say, God, it's all here. Take what you don't want keep what you do and add to me everything anew. He says, sanctify them. Sanctify them. See, friends, God's gates and glory keeps the evil one out, but God's word gets the evil out of you. See, we're adopted. We're bought. We're purchased. We now live in glory. And he's like, I got the gates. I ain't never lost a battle. Let's stay there for a second. You need to know this. Satan is created. Created doesn't get to move around, push around, shove around the creator. He is an angel turned devil, okay? Guess what happens? If God says you don't get in, you don't get in. But there are some things that are in that do need to get out. And that's where God's word comes in. He's like, my gates will keep you from the devil. My gates will protect you from the demons. My gates... These are strong. They have my word. They have my authority. But there's some things that need to get out of you. And friends, if we're not giving ourselves over to sanctification, what are we then calling in over the gates? What are we then stepping outside of the gates into? What other affections are we living in distraction to? Like we talked about earlier. Suddenly, it's like we're not being sanctified, but I'm trying to live in the glory. And it's like, what are you welcoming in? You are a new creation. These things, they don't belong in you because a new creation wasn't designed to work with those things. New creations don't work on old designs. New creations don't run on old blueprints. New creations don't run on the same, bottle of, uh, same battery of the old model, amen? We are different. He says, God guards them. I keep them. But you must be sanctified by your word. You must be sanctified. If we're going to live in the glory, we need to begin to live in the glory. I love this passage because this is such an amazing prayer where God is all three, three and one, one and three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all present. And there's this conversation about you and me and what we are and whose we are. So many Christians today struggle with what they are and whose they are. And it's because you don't know whose you are. Why does my life still look like this? I don't know. Who are you living according to? God, what is even my life? I don't know. Who are you living according to? Because my word tells you what your life will look like when you're living according to me. Worship team, you can make your way up here. You see, Christians, Jesus people, we live in the glory and we are not of the worldly. And I want to finish up 
with this last portion of scripture. Are you here for this? This is the hardest part for us to understand. This will be the hardest part for us to get. But understand this, that if, if Jesus would have stopped, if Jesus would have stopped praying at the, at the gates, at the protection, at the praying for you, if he would have stopped, all of this only would have applied to those 11 disciples. If Peter would have barged in on this prayer and stumbled in like a fool and interrupted Jesus and he got cut off, all of everything I just got done saying, everything Jesus prayed, would have only been for the 11 that have followed him. But here's what Jesus goes on to say about you and me. In John 17, 20 through 26, he says, I do not ask for these only, as in the 11, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, and that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me the glory that you have given me I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one and I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as you loved me Father I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world oh righteous Father even though the world does not know you I know you these know that you have sent me I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known and that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them you see friends this is the hardest part of our faith to understand but we've actually been adopted into brought into married into rescued into saved into oneness with God oneness with God so we're not weak people we're not less than we're not here to live a life of defeatedness but of victoriousness and the reason this is the hardest thing for us to wrap our heads around church is because we can read those words we can hear this message and we begin to think what are you saying, Pastor Matt? Are we gods? No. We aren't gods ourselves, no. But we were made in the image of one. And for his own divine reasoning that often makes no sense to me because I am acutely aware of every single flaw and sin in my own life, he decided in his goodness, in his graciousness, in his mercy that he would die for us so that we could be resurrected back into relationship with him. And so while we may not be gods, we are of the most importance to God. And I wonder today, if we're truly to live from glory, do you understand the great importance that you are to Him? And does our life mirror His great importance to us? Because He says, I in you and I in them, them in you, we become perfectly one. This is the great salvation of our faith this is what it's all about this is what it's all about everything after this is butter it's icing on the cake it's extra it's good if he makes much of your life amazing if he makes you the most famous person in the world to bring him glory awesome if everything you put your hand to is incredibly uh, blessed and fulfilled and financially viable and you are just king great but it's the oneness with you that he's actually after. It's the oneness with you that he values the most. It's the oneness with you that all the blessings flow, all of the make muchness of your life comes from, that when he begins to set you 
through places you don't deserve, it first comes from a place of adoption into his family. Would you guys stand to your feet? Would you just begin leading us worship team? And I just want to pray over the Jesus people right now that you would begin to live in and from the glory of God. Friends, there is no chain that's been on your life that can live in the glory of God. There's an atmosphere and a gravity within the glory of God that when you come into Him, you got to fight real hard to keep the chains on you because the gravity wants to peel them away from you. The gravity of God's glory wants you to be absolutely, exceptionally, without blemish or doubt, free, beautiful, and without blame. And so right now, I just want to pray over you as we begin to worship once again, Father God. Father God, I ask today that for these Jesus people, for this church, for this house, God, for these Christians, we would recognize today, God, that you have welcomed us into a place of glory, a place that we couldn't earn, a place that we don't deserve, a place that we can never achieve or get to on our own, but you sowed us in, you pulled us out, you brought us close, you lifted us up, and you made much of us, God, today. Father, I thank you that every single person in here, God, who loves the Lord Jesus is in oneness with you, God. And whatever that looks like, whatever that means, God, we say we're committed to sanctification. We're committed to being kept. We're committed to you being guard and Lord. God, we thank you, Father. We thank you, God, that you didn't leave just with the disciples of the eleven, but you were the first slain the first sacrifice so that you could be the first among many brothers and sisters. Father, we just thank you today. We thank you that you have sowed us into your family, that today, God, we can marry our motivations with yours. We can mirror our motivations with yours. God, that today we will begin to live Savior-centered lives, not self-centered lives. Father God, today, God, we commit to the glory. We commit to the glory. We put glory on. We don't take glory off, and we thirst and hunger after your righteousness alone. Right now, Father God, we just say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we commit to being a people who are in the world, but live in the glory of God. Who are in the world, but live in the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you're excited.